Do any of you ever have trouble recruiting patients or finding these sites? Uh, what strategies are you using to, to make sure these are done efficiently and cost effective? <laughs> well, we work on a few different fronts. Uh, first one is we try to balance the frontline physicians that do most of the prescribing and try to balance that population with the key opinion leaders, such that by the time the studies are over, we get a good mix of medical feedback uh, from there. We also, early on in our development uh, strategy, decided to hire our own CRA team, as well as you know, CTAs, biostatistics. We brought everything in-house such that uh, we're able to establish a relationship with a certain clinical site and we try to keep that relationship consistent mm -hmm. by sending the same individuals to that site. And after a while, when we go back to them with repeat studies, there's a certain trust that forms between the site and us. And of course, that helps in the recruitment. I imagine you're unique in this group having that in-house. I'm sure a lot of you use uh, contracting services to do a lot of your trials. Yes. Uh, is is it easy working with a lot of these uh, CROs? Um, no. <laughs> what are the challenges? <laughs> this is my fourth uh, company, uh, biopharmaceutical development company that I've run as a CEO. And in almost every instance, the CROs, you have to use a global CRO if you're going to be in multiple countries. Of course you do. But uh, my experience is all the, very much the same as a small biopharmaceutical company, despite what they say to you when they're selling you their project, they, give you, they do not give you, they give you little attention. And, and what really matters is the people on the ground in the organization. The people on the ground, the project managers, CRAs, the central lab, all is what matters. But in terms of strategic senior management and all that they're going to come in and tell you, my experience has been the same. It's, uh, it's, we get much less attention than the large pharmas where they have preferred vendor arrangements with and you know, well, the bulk of the revenue is generated in those organizations. But you manage it. You just understand that going in and what you focus on is the local people that are actually the ones implementing your trial. That's what's most important in my judgment. But I don't see a lot of distinction in my history with, you know, between the firms. I mean, I'd like to build on that. I think one of the learnings um, in my career around this is if, if you go back to your last question, mm -hmm. in the rare disease field, we, in my last company, we recruited for 230 patients, requiring 58 centers in 18 countries. Wow. So that's complicated for a rare disease. And so it's difficult, you know, in order to have that touch, you can't just rely on a third party that may have 20 clients that they're trying to satisfy. So I think it's very important to have your own team establish the relationship with those centers and the purpose and what's been, you know, what's the whole point of this trial and get them motivated. But in terms of the detailed execution around the trial, you have to rely on the whole on third parties. Because and, and to build on that, you know, in our case, in our hepatitis B trial, the recruitment has gone really well. And we're working one of the largest global CROs. But I would attribute it to my internal ClinOps team of two <laughs> and really good people on the ground. Yeah. The project manager, the CRAs, so forth, very good. They're doing a, and, and motivated investigators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, we're, that oftentimes happens, as you know, in whatever disease state where they really want to meet the needs of their patients, where there's a high unmet need. In hepatitis B, there really isn't a functional cure yet today available. And physicians want to find that in their practices. So they're willing to put patients on, you know, in the trial. So that has been a big benefit as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you can't simply outsource to a large CR and hope everything goes well. That, that's, that's, that's delusional. Well, I want to take this uh, thought and bring it sort of, at least for me, to the, uh, to the next level. Uh, when you talk about the CRO, it's really important that you realize what do you ask the CRO to do. Yeah. Because we have one element here, which is sort of the excitement of the site, which is uh, the science that is behind it. These are things that you cannot source out, mm -hmm. or that you cannot outsource. Uh, what 
we have to outsource. There's, there's no question as a company with 24 employees, what you, uh, what you have to outsource is the clinical operations part. And there you are dependent, and I agree with what you said before, it comes down to the project manager in the CRO who is responsible for your study. But uh, the, uh, the question around identifying the right study sites um, and uh, generating the excitement about your trial, that depends on uh, sort of the questions that you are asking, what is the potential medical need that you are addressing, and uh, what are the data behind uh, your ideas around the clinical trial? which has to come uh, from the country, it has to come uh, from the company, it has to come from your science and it has to come from your relationships with the KOLs. Uh, CROs try to sell you that as well, but this is clearly something your chief medical officer has to know the people that are involved in the clinical trial. And uh, working around this, I, I would say that uh, the experience that we are having with, uh, with CROs is actually very good. Interesting. And has consolidation in the CRO space made these challenges greater? No. I think the, the vision of CRO is, uh, as you mentioned, to work with big pharma. But for biotech, is a specific uh, area that they have also an interest to be as rare degree disease or immuno-oncology is a field that they like also is big pharma and biotech working in the same area. The main role is uh, investigator because uh, and key investigator of the trial. They have a role of uh, what they say is to transmit uh, the good sign on in order to say that is interesting. And is a lot of relationship between clinicians. They have a meeting in ESMO, in NASCO, and that is a good uh, timing in order to have um, CRO involved, but also investigator involved in order to transmit the information that we need. Uh, I like to add on to what you said, and also to a previous question. I actually resonate with these people. Uh, I think uh, you know one of the things that we fundamentally believe is an extensive training of investigators and motivation. Uh, because in, in our kind of trial, dermatology, acne, firstly, there are multiple hundreds of people involved, patients. Then there is subjectivity involved. So there's a huge monitoring, what we call online dynamic monitoring, project management is very, very essential. But at the start of the study, to ensure that there is more consistency you know, and, and, and uh, reduce the subjectivity, you need that extensive motivational training to both investigators and other uh, staff in uh, sites. I mean, one can also work with smaller CROs. You don't always have to work with the really large organizations. And there are smaller CROs that really like to work in sort of more niche areas. And so at Orchard, we've deliberately chosen to work with a kind of an orchard size CRO. Uh, because we're not talking about hundreds of centers in this case. We're talking about very specialized centers. and fewer of them, and, and that can be a very good relationship. I want to add one last thing on the topic of CROs. You know, in terms of quality control, in terms of consistency of the relationship, etc., you know, I agree with everyone. Uh, in our case, because we had multiple programs that we could work on, we could justify it from a cost basis to build our own clinical operations team, and that actually helps us turn around the studies much faster. For example, our last phase two study, you know, typically from the last patient, last visit to database lock, it can take as many as you know, two to three months for big pharma and for smaller biotechs, especially if the CROs are not giving them the attention you know, they would like, it can go up to even further, you know, up to four to six months. In our case, we were able to turn it around and lock the database within 48 hours after the last patient last visit. Wow. Now, you know, this is a huge luxury, especially for a small company, you know, small biotech where every day matters. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have the years and decades <laughs> timeline that big pharma can afford. Mm -hmm. Time is money. Yes. So uh, there is the time aspect of whether to go with a CRO or not, or, or do it in-house as well.
And what other strategies are, are each of you using to create better efficiencies, whether it's with patient recruitment or choosing sites or just even designing your, your trials? So, yeah, cool. well, one of the advantages of, I guess, working in the area of transformative medicine is that when you are completely changing the course of a patient's life, in our lead program, we have currently 100% survival rate in a disease where they normally die in the first two years of their life. And that, so you're completely changing that. So the advantage you can have in working in that kind of domain is you could use more of an adaptive trial design where you essentially don't have to keep inventing a next phase. I mean, the, compared to natural history, there is a dramatic difference. And so you, know, you can find a quicker path which allows you to just seamlessly move from an early proof of concept into you know, further evidence that you keep building on from that trial. And, and I think that this is actually a very good route for you know, innovative medicines which make a big difference. To build on that, you know, coming from the rare disease as well, what we try to do is like involve patient advocacy very early on, and particularly in the space of hearing loss, where you, when you look at standard of care, you know, it's it's very poor. So, what we try to do is really understand what's the patient journey, what matters to them, how do we really improve the quality of life, and from there, you know, try to design trials considering these endpoints, and then pressure test with payers, and also try to influence the regulatory agencies to make sure that this makes sense. So bringing in you know, the patient view very on, early on, and then they are the you best advocate as well, because they will also you know, put the information available so that when people are looking for options, a trial can be an option. <laughs> I'd like to repeat that last point, <laughs> emphasize that. <laughs> because especially in today's regulatory environment, you know, with the new commissioner and the new approach that FDA has taken, the pendulum is certainly swinging towards more risk tolerance at the FDA level. What that means is especially for diseases that there isn't much of a precedence, mm -hmm. FDA is also looking for guidance and they're open mm -hmm. for genuine scientific interaction. They don't know exactly what they would like. Whatever published guidance is typically decades old. So it makes it even more important to engage the key opinion leaders, patient advocacy groups, and other stakeholders, and keep each player uh, in the know with respect to what everyone else is doing early and often. Then it's easier to build consensus and everybody's on the same page. <laughs>